Triple B's in the building. Big Baller Brand supports the NBA buzz and the inside buzz. We with you, man. Triple B style. This is 100% going to be one of my favorite interviews that I've ever done. 12-year NBA veteran and insane dunker, one of the best in NBA history, Gerald Green joins me for episode 36 of Inside Buzz. I'm Mikey Domagala, and when fans think of Gerald Green, there's a couple of things that come to mind. His insane dunking ability, his ability to catch fire at any time, his nine and a half fingers, and of course, Gerald being one of the most unfair, as in insanely good, NBA 2K players that has ever been. All of that will be discussed in the interview, as well as how the 35-year-old Gerald Green just unretired from basketball. He was a player development coach with the Houston Rockets, unretired if you want to call it that, and is now playing for the Houston Rockets G League affiliate team. Like I said, 35 years old, but still has crazy bounce and crazy skills. He's looking to make it back to the NBA, no matter what team comes calling. Since he was just a coach for the Rockets, and because of the COVID stuff happening, a lot of players came up from the G League back and forth. Now they're back down. So now Gerald is playing with a couple of the players that he coached. Gerald's 35. Some of these kids are 19, 20 years old. So he was just a mentor and coaching them. Now he's suiting up alongside them. It's a pretty interesting thing happening right now. And Gerald's really hungry for an NBA return. All right, Gerald, welcome to episode 36 of Inside Buzz. I appreciate you coming on, and I'm honored to have you. No, I appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. The first thing I want to touch on before we get into you re- retiring, unretiring, being back in basketball is, do you know you're an NBA 2K legend? In the early <laughs> early to mid-2010s, me and my friends and so many people around the world, use your guy who was like an 80 overall, but he played like a 99. Do you get that often? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I do get that often. I do I do get that often. Uh, um... That, that, that's kind of cool uh, to have that type of, uh, you know, I guess, character or whatever. I, I have no idea. But, um, you know, I actually try to play 2K myself as well every now and then. I'm not I'm not really that good, uh, but um, it's, it's it's cool to play. I, I always want to play with myself, too. That's crazy. But um, that's kind of dope. It's dope. In October of uh, last year, you announced your retirement. Then you became a Houston Rockets player development coach then you know you got the you got the itch again to come back into basketball how'd that all come about and being 35 years old did you think to yourself you know what I'm I'm still young enough to play you know I wasn't I wasn't in the league for a couple years I was kind of trying um you know unfortunately things didn't work out as far as you know me getting on with a team so um I re uh, I reached out to the Rockets um and 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 you know, they offered me a player development job. And I was, you know, so grateful for that. And honestly, like, that was a, a, a big key moment for me in my life that I'll never forget because, you know, that was something different that I never thought I would do. You know, I never thought I'd be a coach. So being able to have that experience and have that <clears throat> have that knowledge and, you know, whatever, I thought I accepted that. But I was playing as coaching, you know, I'm, you know, rebounding. Sometimes you might have to get out there and, you know, play token defense and stuff like that. And as I was doing that type of stuff, you know, I I could feel the fire still there. I could could feel it, but I was like trying to cool it down, but it just got too hot to the point to where I was like, you know what, if I don't try to go back and play again, I'll regret it. And um, I don't want to have that regrets. And, you know, if if it wasn't for, you know, you know, you know, Tillman and Patrick and, 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 and uh, obviously Raphael, man, if it wasn't for those guys making, um, my decision a lot easier for to do it. I still be coaching, but you know they supported me with it, man. And I, once they once I got the support, I was gone. I knew what I knew. I knew what I needed to do for me not to have a regret in this because I've came too far to try to regret anything in my career. You know what I mean? So I felt like for myself, um, it was the right thing to do. Yeah, you got a taste of coaching, and here you are killing it as always. Twenty two points per game, five and a half rebounds per game over your four, first four G League games. After not playing in about two years, what's it like bowling again and being healthy? Man, it's it's great, man. I'm not gonna lie, I'm having a great time of uh, just being out there with those young guys, man. Those young guys, we got a lot of talent on the team. Um, um, our coach, man, Mark Mood, he's been fantastic, man. Just you know, being able to you know play under his system and see like how he does things is great. But man, just getting back out there on the floor and competing, man, was you know that was the that was the fire that I still had in me, you know. And so for me to go out there, you know, and, and, and play it, you know, at a high level still, even when I have taken two years off, you know, I'm blessed to, you know, I'm blessed to be in this situation and still have my body hold up. 
And two weeks ago, you're coaching some of these kids, 15, 20 years younger than you. Well, not, not 20, like 10 to 15 years younger than you. Now you're playing with them. How does that make you feel? You know, it's, it's good. You know, hopefully, you know, uh, you know, hopefully my my story or, you know, what I've done in my career motivates, you know, the next player who gets older. That's like, yeah, you know what? I want to keep giving it going. That's you no, know, that's what it's all about. You know, when I when, when I'm done with the game, I'm going to be done with it. You know, I, I learned that. I learned that, you know, and it took, you know, so. I've, I've, man, just being out there with those young guys, being able to compete, then that's, that's, it, it, that, that, that's all, that's what it's all about right there. And a few minutes ago, you said you never thought you would be a coach. Now, you saying that and getting the taste of coaching, is that something you would think about I doing love, again? I love it. I love coaching. Like, it was very, it, it was a hard decision, obviously, but, you know, I feel like I made the right one. But, man, coaching is something that I definitely see myself doing when it's all said and done. I love the impact that you can have on a team as a coach. You know what I mean? You, you, you kind of set the tone. You know, you do a lot of preparation. You're preparing your guys to, you know, go into a war every game. You know what I mean? Every game's different. So, you know, the preparation that coach is doing, the scouting, the knowing every detail of the opponents, man, I kind of I kind of fell in love with that. I'm not going to lie. So I, I did. I never thought I would be a coach, but that was something that now b being that for, you know, a few months, I fell in love with it, actually, man. And I actually, like, I know that's for a fact. That's something I'm definitely going to want to do when I retire. And that's even pretty inspirational to anybody watching that. If you dwell into something you aren't sure about, that you would like, just take the chance and maybe you'd fall in love with it like you did with coaching. So that's, nah, that's awesome. Exactly. exactly. I agree. I agree, man. Because, you know, in life, a lot of people are scared to take, you know, um, try new things because they might they might feel like they might succeed or they might feel like, oh, I'm not going to be good at it. You know what I mean? And I kind of had that feeling with coaching. I didn't know, but I, I went at it, learned on the fly, and, and I felt like I was I felt like I was doing pretty good with it. Only thing I felt like, I just felt like that I just still wanted to play basketball still because I was around the game and I just needed to go burn that desire out. But, man, I, I fell in love with coaching. Like, it was a really hard decision, honestly. It really was, but I feel like coaching is going to be something I'm going to do. And that's the thing, man. Like, sometimes you got to take that extra step because you might learn something that you might love as well, you know, so. You're Gerald Green, 12-year NBA veteran. Teams know your play style, what you bring to the table. But if a team was watching, you know, Gerald just came off a two-year stint of, you know, not being healthy, not playing. He's 35. What would you say to a team looking at you right now? What I would say to a team? I mean, I know I know what I can do. I, can, I know what I can bring to the table far as leadership um as far as you know energy you know you can never have a guy that can you can it's, you can always have a guy who's been willing to tell, help the young guys help them grow understand their role but at the same time if you need him he's ready to go there's there's not too many guys who can sit on the bench for multiple games and come in the game and be ready to play efficiently i think i've shown that throughout my entire career and so not not that leads us to say i feel like i can shoot the ball pretty well um with the best of them and, and I know my role. I've been around this league. I understand sometimes you're not going to play, but, you know, you be a professional. You show young guys how to be a pro. You know, even guys that are like four or fifth year players in the league, sometimes they don't know how to be a pro yet until they have a veteran like me who's been around, who's kind of understand the, the, the grit and grind of it. You know, having somebody like that present is always, I think, good for any team. Who was that for you in your career coming into the league? Who was that vet that really taught you the ropes in the beginning? I would have to say Juwan Howard, man. Juwan Howard taught me a lot. Um, Paul Pierce, obviously, you know, he wasn't that old yet, um, as per se. Um, Theo, I would say Theo Ratliff was a was a big guy who, who kind of told me, "Look, man, you just got to play your role, know what you're gonna do." Um, but I mean, I, I came into league with a lot of young guys too. You know what I mean? So I came into league with Tony Allen. He was a lot. He was a big key. You know, a lot of my development. Me and Tony, when I was a rookie, man, he was a he was always in my ear, always checking on me. We was always hanging out. I, me and Tony Allen, I was always always messing with Tony. You know what I mean? I feel like my rookie year, he helped me a lot, like grow and learn how to like, okay, gee, this is what you're gonna need to do to kind of stick in this league. You know what I mean? You're gonna have to really grind out. And I remember the second year, you know, it, it was like I just kept doing the same thing. He get hurt and I get traded. And I just remember. Like, that always just kept that same mentality. It's like, look, just keep grinding, keep grinding, keep grinding, no matter what, just keep grinding. Like, things don't work out. Just keep grinding. Don't worry about things you can't control. Just keep yeah. grinding. That that right there, like, really stuck with me. Um, you know, obviously, I was consistent, inconsistent with it. Everybody that has, but, you know, 
for the most part, I've been consistent with my grind, and that's I think that's why I've gotten this far in my career. In the Houston Rockets, one of the youngest teams in the NBA, loads of talent. Just listen to these names and how young they are. Kevin Porter Jr., Jalen Green, Josh Christopher, Christian Wood, Shangun, K.J. Martin, Deshaun Tate. The list goes on and on. Um, what does this team need to do to compete? Is it time? They just need to grow? They just need to grow, man. Like, I think they're a really good young core. I think I think the Rockets did a good job of drafting. Even their two-way guys is good. You know what I mean? Like, they got good – they got good players on their team. Now, yes, they obviously – you know, they still got to learn. They got to learn how to win games. That's the hardest part in the NBA is winning basketball games. That's hard. But they got a great core that they're, that they're de developing. You know, I feel like Jalen Green could be a star if he really just keeps staying locked in and stay focused. I think Christian Wood is is pretty much there. We just got, you know, he just got to just keep on, keep on staying the course and just keep being consistent. And I mean, and Scoop, man, it's, it's sky's the limit for him, man. You know, if he just keeps his head clear and, and, and just keeps, you know, trying to lead the team like he's been doing lately, man, I think, I think, man, sky's the limit for him. I mean, we could be looking at the next James Harden, you know what I mean, with him. That's just my opinion. I mean, you got the, those just three guys right there, but you still got guys like Deshaun Tate. You know, you got, you know, uh, KJ. You know, you got several guys. You got Garrison. I don't think you mentioned his name. He's a he's a really good player, you know what I mean? You, you got so many. Armani, you know, you got so many young guys over there that, that, you can really grow, and, and they all love each other. You can tell, like, when I was there, I mean, you can tell they tight, they close. You know, that's what you want as a team. I really think Rafael, I think, I think Rafael did a good job of putting those guys together. I'm not going to lie. He did a great job. You know what I mean? It's, I think I think in the next few years, you know, the Rockets could be a really good team. I'm not going to lie. Even with the pieces they got, I'm not going to lie. I think they could be a good team when they start. When they Once they start learning how to win, it's over. It's over for them because they they got the talent, they got the speed, they got the talent, they got the size. All it needs is just a few couple, a couple more years of just you know letting players develop, and I think the Rockets are gonna be a team not to mess with. I'm not gonna lie, that's just my opinion. In that recent blow up with KPJ and Christian Wood and uh, assistant coach Lucas. Now, you could look at that as something that would happen in the NBA, you know, behind closed doors, but it got public. But it seems like it all came through and it was okay a couple of days later. Kevin Porter Jr. bounced back from that, his first game back, hit a game winner, and there he is hugging Coach Lucas. So take me through a situation like that. You know, tempers flare, it blows up, and then you get over it? Or is that something that's, you know, is it in the past is basically what I'm asking. And first of all, I mean, it wasn't really as bad as everybody kind of really said it was, honestly. I'm just, I was there, so I know. You know what I mean? That's just first and foremost. Second, yeah, of course, it's, it's you can get over it. You know, at the end of the day, Luke wants KPJ to be successful, and KPJ wants Lucas to be successful as well. We all, you know, it's a family. At the end of the day, the organization is a family. They don't want to see each other not be successful. And, you know, obviously, man, when you lose games so much you have, when two people want it like that, coaches and players, that means something. That means you got something. You know, when you got one coach, when you got the coaches want it, but the players don't, there's an issue. When you got the players want it, but then the coaches don't, is an issue. But when you got the coaches want it and the players want it, but then it didn't happen, you always, yeah, it's going to be a little something, but it's never going to be to the point to where how the media made it seem. You know, you get over it, you win games, you hug, and that's just how it is. Next games, he had a game winner, and that's how the league is. You get over it, you keep winning, and that's why, you know, that's 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 just the league, man. But that's not just the league. That's life in general. It's anything. You know, you, you can't, can't hold on to something that you can't control, can't worry about. You know what I mean? So, but honestly, man, it wasn't even nothing like that, man. That's why I'm glad that the outcome when he came back was exactly how it was. Game winner. He's talking this smack. We should get up out of here, man. I love it. <laughs> you at 35, I saw you when you're still the player development coach. You posted something on Instagram of you doing some nasty windmill in socks. Now, dunking at 35 and dunking at 25, does it still feel the same? Uh, it, it honestly, it does, but you, I, I can see, you know, I can see that I'm not 25 anymore, you know, <laughs> definitely see that. So, but it's, you know, I'm blessed to still be able to, you know, still jump with the best of them. KJ Martin, Jalen Green have hops of their own. Did, did either of them challenge you to any dunk offs or anything when you're coaching? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Jalen did. It's all, we, every time I see Jalen, we always talk a little smack about, you know, who got the most hops. Well, that's my boy, man. But, uh. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, man. I mean, not just them, those two guys. A lot of people try to challenge me, you know what I mean? But, but you know, I, I still, I, I'm always think I'm the, I'm the best. Yeah, I mean, that's how you got to think to, you got to think that to be the best. So, um, Jalen Green, a notable name to jump from high school to the NBA G League Ignite. Now, you coming out of high school, what do you think of this whole G League Ignite thing with, uh, they give future college scholarships, obviously money up front, and then an avenue right to the NBA. Jalen went number two in the draft. What do you think of all this? I mean, I love it. I mean, it's an opportunity for young kids to be able to take care of their family at a young age when when, when he's, you know, capably ready. I think Jalen's a great example. I mean, he's a great kid, comes from a great family. You know, he's able to, you know, change his family lives. But, I mean, he's a real humble kid that works on his game. You know what I mean? I feel like, you know, I'm a player that jumped out of high school, so, um, you know, that's that's always I feel like, you know, if a kid's ready to go out of high school, he's 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 and he's mentally sound, even though he's young. You know, I feel like, you know, you should always have an opportunity to go take care of your family. So I, I'm very I'm, I, I support, you know, you know, I support the whole movement. And the John Wall situation, he's healthy, still able to play at a high level. But, you know, money is in there. They're trying to trade him. What can you say about how he's handled the situation and how he's been a mentor to all those like, young studs? Like a professional. I mean, he, you know, he hasn't done anything he should not be doing, you know. I mean, he's, he's handling it like a professional. You know, he understands, you know, where the organization is at right now. John's been in the league for a while. You know, he understands, you know. And I think he's just being the ultimate professional. I think, you know, I think for John, he just got, for me, he just has, I think for him, he just needs to just stay in shape and just be ready, you know, whatever, whatever the next opportunity it is, even if it is with the Rockets or not, you just got to be ready for it. But I think whatever it is, I think how he's handling this situation, I think he's handling it like a professional. For sure, and I agree with you. Um, you being from Houston, what was it like playing, I believe, briefly in 2008, maybe one or two games, then 2017, 2020, and now you're still in Houston coaching and now in the G League. What's it like just being home and making a home with your hometown team? Man, I, you know what? The first time it happened, I didn't really – I took it for granted. Honestly, took it for granted. Um, just being able to get to play for home, you know. You know, I – just obviously being in the NBA is a blessing in itself, but being in the NBA and get to play for your hometown team, that's like two dreams in one. So, you know, that was, uh, you know, that's, 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 where I, that's how I've always felt about Houston. You know, even when, when, when it's all said and done, I'm, I'm going to be still representing, still, you know, holding Houston down. That's just, that's just me in general. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, when you think of Houston, I want you to think of Gerald Green. That's, that's, this, that's just how much I represent Houston. So I'm going to always kind of like, you know, you know, I didn't, I didn't understand that at first. You know what I mean? Kind of, I kind of got older, and then it just happened. Really, those Rockets teams you were on from 2017 to 2020 were incredible. NBA Buzz fans wanted me to ask you this. I put out a little questionnaire of what fans would want to ask you on this show. They want to know why did that the, one of those teams not win a championship with Harden and Chris Paul at the helm? Um, I mean, shoot, you know. You know, I I think about that same. I asked I asked myself the same question: Why? You know, we we missed shots. I, honestly, when Chris Paul got hurt, that was the reason why we ain't win. And I feel like that was our year when he got hurt. And I you know I think about that. You know that I think about that shit all the goddamn time. I ain't gonna lie, that shit that like hits me because it's like, as a player, you might not ever get that close again. You know what I mean? Ever, like ever, you might not never get that close. Like that right there, we went, we get, we get, we one game, we go to the finals. You might not. I've gotten to that point twice in my career, twice. So, and that's hard. And as long as I've been playing the league, I only got there twice. So, you know, I just, you know, it's one of them things, man. You know, when CP got hurt, it's the name of the game. You know, you got to. It is what it is. Same thing that make you laugh, make you cry, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that year, I believe, would have been against LeBron and Cleveland. How would you guys have matched up? I think we would have beat them. We would have beat them. We was a better team that year. You know, I get it, LeBron's LeBron, and, you know, I get it. But I don't. We, I think we had already beat them, like, twice already. You know, I think the first time we played them, I wasn't there. I think we beat them. I think they we beat them at our place. Then we went back to their place. We smacked them by, like, 30. We wasn't. We was ready for them. We already knew who we needed to get across, and that was Golden State. I mean, it yeah. just it was just too much. Well, if you look at those Cleveland teams, I mean, listen, as great as LeBron was, those teams were very top heavy, and your Houston team had a hell of a bench with you at the forefront of it. So that probably would have been the difference in that series, whose bench could outperform the other. 
No, I think I honestly think with that would have beat Cleveland. I mean, pretty easy. And not not saying that any disrespect to that team. You know what I mean? I just think that that Rockets team that we had that year was special. We were special, man. We were special that year. I think it's like I said, CP don't get hurt. We definitely win a ring. That's 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 wow. That's easy. <laughs> And playing with Chris Paul and James Harden, two of the greatest guards ever, how did, how did playing with them make it easier on you? Man, James make it so much easier just because how much, you know, he, he draws so much attention, you know, at, at all times. So with James, it's all you got to do is really pretty much set a screen, let him just create, let him draw the double team, and then you kick it, and then you just play from there. Then it's all about just going downhill, pass, and kick, and then it's just you getting wide open shots constantly. And then, you know, you have CP, who's just a point guard wizard. You know, he gets, you know, every big man paid. You know what I mean? He just uses the screen and roll to perfection and just can find plays that he's just so smart. You know what I mean? So playing with those two guys that are dynamic, man, it's easy. All you got to do is just sit back and just find the open pockets. <laughs> They're going to, you know what I mean? All you got to do is knock down a shot. It was just, it was, a, you know, it was, it was, it was a joy playing with those guys, man. I'm not going to lie, both of them. It was, it was a joy playing with both of them. How can I have Gerald Green on this and not talk about dunking? You know, you know what I'm going to ask you. Tell me the story of how you had your finger amputated from dunking with the ring on. So that, so I, so that's this crazy part. I've never, that's not the story. I never was dunking. I, I had a, I had a, it was like a nail on top of a door ledge, like at my house. So I was, I had my mom's class ring on and I was used to like run and jump, see how high I can touch on top of the door. And I was challenging my brother saying like, you can't jump as high as me. Well, duh, he was five years younger, but I used to just always like pick on him like that. Aha, you can't jump as high as me type. So I was jumping and that's what happened. The, the nail, I had the ring on, the nail was sticking out. It got caught in the ring and yanked my finger off. Oof. And immediately to the emergency room, immediate amputation? Yeah, pretty much. They took, we tried to save it. Um, they said they couldn't save it at that time. You know, they didn't have technology and stuff, so. Um, yeah, they had to amputate it. They said they could have saved it, but they said that my hand would have been like so straight and like it wouldn't even it it, it wouldn't even a sign that it was even gonna heal right. So it was kind of like if we don't, if it was like if they don't cut off to my joint, then I could possibly cut off like my entire I could lose my entire finger. And then they're gonna have to like resurge in my hand. So my dad was like, Yeah, that's just too many ifs. Yeah. So it was, yeah, we're just gonna cut it off. And then he knew I wanted to play basketball because obviously I was still playing. I was playing basketball. Um, and so he was like, well, this hand being stiff, he ain't going to be able to like really, he ain't going to be, he ain't gonna, that's not going to be good for a basketball player. He needs to be able to like move his hands, open his like, or have an open and closed fist. So he was like, nah, we was like, nah, we'll just, just cut it to the joint. And that's what they did. Having half a finger, nine and a half fingers, does that affect your play at all? Nah, I mean, you know what? Not really, man. Like, when I was young, I, it, it, what, it, what it used to affect me it used to affect my mental. Like I was embarrassed about it, so it was like more embarrassing. Like I didn't ever want to talk about it. Like I never wanted. I ain't really start wanting to learn. I ain't really got comfortable talking about it to my finger, honestly, until I was like thirty, bro. Wow. You know what I mean? Like honestly, like I probably did a few other times just because of what it was, but like I was always like real insecure about it. Like I really was, like because that was something that. You know, growing up, man, I had I had a lot of issues dealing with that. You know what I mean? So I was always insecure about my finger. You know what I mean? Always. So, but basketball wise, man, nah. -uh. I remember when it first happened when I was little. I had to have two. I had to have two surgeries because I wasn't like cleaning my bandages enough, and I was always getting them dirty just because I was a kid. So, but and I was hooping too. I was hooping. So I had surgery, right? I'll never forget. I had surgery the next day. It wasn't even like. I didn't, I didn't even have to stay in the hospital. I went there in the morning. They put me on anesthesia. I woke up. I went home. Next day, I had school. They were telling me, do not play basketball. You can't play. You just had surgery yesterday, and it's all sweaty. We're going to be right back in here. I was right back hooping on the blacktop. Right back hooping. Like, that's just – and I should have known then, like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm probably end up playing ball. I didn't even know then I was even going to want to play basketball. I was just doing it for fun. But, nah, even then, like, even with a bandage, Stitches in my nub, all that. I'm still hooping. Like it never affected me. You know what? I know everybody know about that young kid that got that one. We got the one arm, right? Look how good he is. With one arm, bro. That's tough. Like that right there goes to show you. Like man, I don't care what happened. Man, if he had two arms, bro, you know how dangerous he would be right now. That he's that good, bro. He's counting with just one. 
I'm, I, he's we're doing it with just one, bro. It's sick. Like I, I'm really actually, um, I'm like rooting for him. You know what I mean? I'm rooting for him to like break all odds, like show people, like man, I can do this with one arm. I, I'm really rooting for him, bro, because he's really a good player. You can tell he's good. You know what I mean? I'm really rooting for him. I really am. Another guy, actually, in the NBA. I don't know if you know this, Gerald. Uh, Davis Bertans. David, David Bertans got the same yep. hand. I know. Exactly. Yep. Same hand, same finger. Oh wow, huh. that's pretty interesting, yeah. actually. Um, you yeah. won, you won the 2005 McDonald's All American Dunk Contest. Another one in the NBA. Then you became a runner up. Uh, the famous blowing out the candle dunk. How did you think of that one in the dunk contest? Uh, I thought it got robbed, but I mean, a lot of people did. So you know, I feel like I should have won that dunk contest. Honestly, I, I feel like I should have won that. Yeah, a lot of people say I did win it. Honestly, I still think I won that dunk contest. Even I just didn't get the trophy. I mean, listen, honestly, like people don't like people talk about my cupcake dunk more than anything about that dunk. People think that when I go when like obviously, you know your research, you know your homework. So you know like exactly what year I won. A lot of people think I won that year. That's yeah, no, you won the other year. Yep. I won the other year. You get what I'm saying? So I just don't I to me, I feel like I ain't never lost a dunk contest. The only one I lost is the one I did in Houston. I think the one that obviously in New Orleans. I feel like that one was more promoted to go another way because of the player I was going against. The White Howard was hot that year. Yeah, he, he was, was a man. He was a face. He was, of the NBA. he was a face of the NBA. He was a face of the league, man. So it was like it was. I, I was just <laughs> Gerald Green. That was a young Gerald Green that just yeah. won the dunk contest with no name. You have this guy that's almost MVP. He's on every commercial. He's on every Adidas commercial. Who y'all think gonna win? And then that's the first year we do votes. Come on, man. There's there's always politics and, and some stuff with the NBA every now and then. So, you know, he was that the Superman year? When, when he flew up like Superman? Yeah, that's the Superman year. I don't take no, I, I don't take no, I, I, I still give him all the credit in the world for, you know, trying to be creative and all of that, man. Like I said, it was a fun experience. Personally, I just feel like I, I feel like I won. That's just how I feel. I feel like the stuff I did, the stuff I was bringing out, my creativity, which is lights out. I got a 38 for the candle dunk. 35 for that dunk. I can't remember what grade score I got. But like if 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 you don't if you if you do your if you do your research the next year after that, they start letting the replay play and then and then uh they start judging. So I actually changed the rule of that. Off the birthday cake dunk really was changed a lot of shit. like it was okay now at first you see the dunk and the judges will pull up their car quick after the birthday cake dunk that changed now you looked up at the arena and then now you hear the crowd noise and then you pull out your thing all that changed off that but if you if you if you really go see you'll be like damn check it out you'll be like damn you're really right i remember i'm gonna go watch it back after this again I'm so i'm gonna you'd be like damn you was right and i remember when I did it, everybody was like, what, what did he do? And I was like, man, y'all see I blew that out? But the only, the only person that really caught it was me and Rashad McCants. We were the only ones that caught it. Also, Gerald, I feel like what people don't give too much credit for is how high you got up for that freaking dunk. They don't fully understand that you you did just cock back. It wasn't anything super flashy, but what, what mattered about it was how high you got and the blowing of the cake, like you said. I I I, had, I didn't even really honestly. I'm gonna tell you something. I didn't even really realize how high I was. I just was so focused on blowing that damn candle out. Because if I ain't blow that candle out, man, I would have been like, oh man, that would have that would have been a bad moment. It would have. It would have <laughs> been a bad moment. <laughs> so Gerald, why don't more players, you know, big time dunkers and even superstars, why don't they go in the dunk contest? A lot of them. I really don't want to be labeled as the dunk, and I get it. I get it. Honestly, I get it. I was thinking, I was thinking like that for the longest time, um, because like I was, I was, I was, I would honestly, I, I hate that I didn't get a dunk contest every year, honestly. But because like sometimes that's just who you are, you know what I mean. But I feel like players feel like you kind of get put in the, you kind of get put in the box, like oh he's just a dunker, you know what I mean? Like like people think Vince Carter, people don't realize how good Vince Carter was. I don't think people feel like forget that Vince Carter wasn't just not he was just not a dunker he was he was an in game dunker 
but he could do other dunks as well because he was just, you know, so athletic. But Vince Carter was a hell of a good bass basketball player. He could do it all. Yeah. Pick and roll, shoot the ball, post up, mid-range, like finish. It wasn't really nothing Vince Carter really couldn't do on the court. <laughs> but we label him as a dunker, you know what I mean? So think about, think about like, I'm glad Zach Levine has really come into his own. You know what I mean? Because at first, they was doing him the same way. Just a dunker, you know what I mean? It's like, just because you won a dunk contest don't mean you're just a dunker. So I think a lot of people stray away from it. You know what I mean? Just because of that reason. So this is a two-part question. When was your first dunk, and when did you go from rim grazers in the beginning to doing 360s between the legs and all crazy stuff like that? My, my Maybe like my freshman year or sophomore year. I was a late bloomer, I'm not going to lie, because I couldn't palm the ball because of my finger. So... Like when I started dunking, like I remember trying to dunk and I couldn't dunk and people was making fun of me. So I remember me like just all, all summer I wore like ankle weights, literally. Everywhere I went, just wore ankle weights. Everything I did, I wore ankle weights all summer. I, I think I maybe grow an inch. I don't know, I can't remember, I don't think so. And then I just, I remember trying out for the team and I remember just going up to like dunk and I like dunked it like, I was way high. Like I actually like, Threw the ball away over the rim because I was I was dunking it like from like going like I was going baseline. You know what I mean? If I was going like baseline, you know what I mean? Yep. Man, I tried to like like dunk it and I was like, damn! I like threw the ball way over the rim, but I got so high that I was like I was like, whoa! You know what I mean? And that's why like, then so I went from like almost like not like almost barely dunking to like doing windmills instantly when I started dunking. And one of your most famous dunks. I remember watching this live. So I'm in New York, you know, the local the local games of the Knicks and the Nets, even when they were in Jersey. That alley oop windmill dunk, was that just out of nowhere or have you done that before? Uh, no, honestly, bro, it was not. So like so the like the that afternoon before, right before, you know, that the game before leading up to that, I was talking to one of my I'm talking to one of my partners. And he like, man, you going against Houston, bro. You know, you got to show out. I'm like, yeah. He's like, I was like, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to bust the ass. Woo -woo. He like, man, you got to have a crazy dunk, bro. And I was like, huh? He was like, bro, you need to get, you need a crazy dunk. And when you do, you need to point at your arm because, you know, I got Houston tat on my arm. He's like, bro, you need to do a crazy dunk. I'm like, bet, bet, bet. So I, so I remember just, I remember um, that I just had that in my head like, yo, I got to get something crazy. Because I, I think that game, I don't know. I mean. I, I, I think I, I think I might I, I might have been on the last day of my two day, of my ten day, so I was already thinking like man I gotta I gotta do something to kind of buzz a little bit maybe you know what I'm saying like I gotta kind of do something that's gonna get on ESPN pretty much because I know we ain't gonna show on TV, so I'm like man I gotta get on ESPN tonight that's something I got to I don't care I gotta get on ESPN, so quite naturally I, I must have manifested it because man I swear I, at this point panned out quick like. I forgot, I think Petro got a long rebound. I was like on the wing and it was like Louis Scola. And Louis Scola, I mean, he's never was gonna ever catch me on a fast break. <laughs> so I got him behind me and I think he's, I forgot who was in the middle, but I, Mar Marshawn Brooks, man, threw the perfect lob. And I remember when he threw it, cause I honestly, I, I was just thinking, okay, here it goes. But I'm not thinking windmill, cause I don't know how he's throwing it. So when I see the lob, oh, I'm like, oh, I'm windmilling this. <laughs> And that's just how I went. And I'm like, oh, this is easy. And, but I didn't really think about the gratitude of that. Like, I never thought people would 10 years to this day still talk about that one dunk, bro. That's sick. Gerald, it that's is. Sick. It's one of the most, and I'm not even being biased because you're on my show. It's one of the most impressive dunks. And, you know, I'm in the NBA media world. It's one of the, mo it's one of the dunks I see all the time. I've seen it so many times. It's ridiculous, and it's so impressive every time. It, it's honestly an honor, man, honestly. Like, I, I didn't realize that. I didn't really realize how big that dunk was until I won a, a social media award, and I had no social media. Who is the greatest dunker in NBA history, in your opinion, and then the greatest dunker today? I mean, you mentioned Vince and Levine. I mean, those are mine, so I'd love to hear yours. I, I would have to go with Vince. I'm sorry. Like, I, I know, it's you know, you got the MJs and the... You know, the Dominique Wilkins, and, and, and I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. The Spud, I get it. But, man, Vince, Vince changed the game, man. Vince had guys like 
He, I think he, I, I don't, it's a game changer. Like, he has so many guys. Like, ain't nobody seen the elbow dunk before. I've never seen it until Vince did it. You know, so, like, he just did, like, I don't know. To me, I feel like Vince is by far the, the greatest. And I think in today's age, man, it's tough, man. I think a lot of people forget about uh, the kid that wanted, uh, what is it, Derrick Jones Jr.? Yep. He could like, fly. I, he can fly, man. So it's like, man, he's tough. He's tough. I think people forget about how, how you know, he's super athletic. But, man, he, you know, you can't ever forget about Aaron Gordon might be the best dunker that ain't never won one. Yeah. <laughs> I, think he got, I think he got robbed that year. What do you think? Uh, you know what? That's tough. It's not well, like Zach would didn't just do some stuff too, though. But, man, I kind of feel like, man, yeah, that one. I, I, you know what? I wouldn't mind it. I wouldn't even mind just saying, "Look, man, both y'all win, bro." Like y'all did. That was one of the best. I ain't gonna lie. That's the best dunk contest I've ever seen. For sure, it had me glued, and I'm not really glued to dunk contests like that. Cause I'm like, ah, I, I, I could have done that. I should have just got back in. That's how I be thinking. But that one right there, I was like, "Damn, that was a really good dunk contest." Talking about Vince, you know, I was rewatching all your dunk contests last night. I got to do my homework on you. The McDonald's dunk contest, you did the elbow dunk like Vince. So he really did have an influence on you. He did, exactly. You know, I, I, that's what I'm saying. Like, Vince, when, when I first saw that, like, I, I, I saw all I wanted to do was dunk. Like, I, of course, everybody wants to dunk. But, like, man, like, that was, like, winning the dunk. The way Vince did it. And then he was going against people. Like, he was going against Steve Francis. Steve Francis. Like if if he would if Steve Francis would have did any other dunk contest besides Vince, he would have won that with flying colors. And <laughs> Tracy McGrady, don't forget about T Mac. He was in. And T-Mac. I'm saying, I forgot, I, I forgot about T Mac. This is crazy. He was his own teammate at the time too, and he's helping him and then dunking against him. It it really was to turn the century. This turn, landmark okay. dunk contest. No, for sure, for sure. I think that Zach Levine and. Aaron Gordon, Aaron Gordon was gonna have the same effect laying down the run. Like they, people are gonna remember that two dunk contest for the rest of their life. But man, Vince, nah, bro, Vince is like that one guy. Is like man, like man, he he had man, he changed the game when it comes to dunking. I'm not gonna lie, he changed the game. You averaged 16 a game in 28 minutes per game, uh, half starting, half off the bench. 2013-14 for Phoenix. Uh, what clicked for you that season in particular as a career high in points? Uh man, just I had an opportunity. Um, I had a just a, a solid opportunity, man. Like, you know, that was probably one of the most minutes I played in a lot of places. So, and I was started. I was like, a, a lot of those games I was starting because Eric Blesso got hurt. So, this opportunity, man. I think it was Jeff Hornacek first year coaching, which is crazy because me and him were, were assistant coaches with the Rockets this year. So it's kind of a great coincidence. But no, nah, man, it was a good team. We had a good team, man. I was probably always, always, I always say this, like. Yeah, like, like even though uh, the, the Phoenix Suns, that team that we've had was by far my favorite team. I always say that. Like, as far as, like, closeness, we I've never had a team still to this day, everybody on that Phoenix Suns team still talk to each other, still, still communicate, still, like, you know, that don't happen in the league. You know, you play one team, you, you know, next year you're out of there. Like, we all, that first year, that first year team, we, we are all still tight. Every year, that's our. I will never forget that. Like that was, we were so close, and so I mean, I, that's one thing about that team. And we was like, we was real close. Like, don't get me wrong, we was close as the Rockets. You know what I mean? That year when we almost we had CP, we was close. That's a special team too. But I don't think that that, that Phoenix Suns team, as far as how we used to like, kick, like rock and kick it, like no, I ain't never seen them like that. Like we still are tight to this day, all of us. I just thought of something. Interesting, Gerald. On that team was Isaiah Thomas a couple years before the breakout. So you were teammates with IT. And then in Houston, you were teammates with Carmelo Anthony during that 18-game, you know, year. And we'll just call it the year because everybody knows what I'm talking about. Both of them, you know, were kind of blackballed at one point, IT and Melo. What can you say about that? Man, you know, that just, you know, IT, IT man, just, you know, it's unfortunate with IT. That's my guy, man. He got hurt. You know, he 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 played his butt out in Boston and was kind of playing through an injury that he probably, you know, shouldn't have been playing through and that, you know, kind of set him back. You know, Melo, you know, I think Melo, um, the situation was unfortunate for him when he was with Houston. Um, you know, didn't nobody really want to see him go. I think we all had to learn to love him. But, man, 
you know, the things that he did, the never stopped, he kept progressing. He never, you know, never stopped, you know, kept at it with his crafts, believed in himself. And, you know, shit, what he did in Portland those couple of seasons, man, and shit, what he's doing down in the Lakers, I mean, he's shooting lights out this year. I mean, he's shooting lights out. So, you know, I'm, I'm very happy for both those guys. And, as a matter of fact, I think I see IT signed a, a 10 day with the Lakers, I think, too. So, I mean, both those guys, you know, then overcame, you know, a lot of issues in the past from, you know, trying to get back in the league and was, you know, always coming up short. But I'm, I'm happy for both of them, you know, for getting it back right. You've been around great coaches like Doc Rivers, Adelman, Spolstra, D'Antoni. What did you take from them for you being a coach this past season with the Rockets? Man, I took a little bit of everything. Just, you know, I didn't, I, I, obviously, I didn't really know how to be a coach. You know what I mean? So, I, I know what I did take from from, from Mike D'Antoni. Just, I, it's something real, nothing. But Mike D'Antoni used to always wear his watch, like his silk, like his Rolex watch. So I used to always wear my Rolex watch, thinking I was Mike D'Antoni. I guess it's it's nothing. I don't know. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I learned a lot from Silas though, in the life, you know, from from months up before, you know, as far as how to prepare as coaches. You know, like I said, I didn't know how to be a coach. So, you know, I was when I learned from all those other coaches, I'm learning as a player but I'm not really learning how to prepare as a, as a coach. You know what I'm saying? I'm not really learning how to prepare. And hey, how do you, how do you get ready for practice? You know, what are we going to talk about for film? How do you, how do you say, how do you get, how do you get film prep? You know what I mean? How do you clip, you know, all you, how do you edit like that? So it was like, the, those guys were teaching me so much in like past two months that I was like, yo, that's, 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 that's what's up. But that's the only thing I probably took from other coaches. How Mike Dan Tony used to wear his watch here, right? So I was like, man, Coach got a nice watch ever. Who's your favorite to win the championship this year, Gerald? I have no idea. I have no idea, honestly. I think I think Golden State's gonna be tough. I just I think they're gonna be tough. And and lastly, Gerald, at 35, if you get a call from an NBA team, are you taking it? Or because you're a family guy now, you know, towards the end of your career, does the situation have to be right? I mean, no, I mean, the, the, the name of the game is, you know, play basketball at the highest level you can play, to play at, you know, but, you know, right now I'm just having fun in the G League, and that's what it's all about, but, you know, it's all about, you know, playing at the highest level with the best competition, so why would I turn that down? I love it. That's got to be the mentality. And, Gerald, thanks so much for coming on episode 36 of Inside Buzz. A pleasure meeting you, a pleasure having this interview with you, so. No, it's all good. Appreciate it. For Gerald Green, I'm Mikey Domegala, and that was episode 36 of Inside Buzz. All Inside Buzz interviews can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and here on YouTube. So go like, subscribe to all the previous videos, and there'll be some more Inside Buzz videos coming soon.